Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session on vectors and their impact on plant, animal and human disease, which is being put on by um, two centres of expertise funded by Scottish Government. One, the EPIC Centre of Expertise on uh, animal disease outbreaks and the other on, from the Plant Health Centre. And um, I'm very pleased to be joined on the podium by Ian Tote from the James Hutton Institute, who I've known since before the centres became um, into being. And um, it's quite unusual, perhaps, for a, an animal scientist and a plant health scientist to be on the same um, platform. But we hope to show this afternoon that um, working together and thinking about some of these issues together is a helpful way in addressing them more sustainably and perhaps with fewer unintended consequences. So the, the plan for the afternoon is that we are going to present a small number of slides highlighting some of the work on vectors and vector-borne disease, and then we want to engage in the discussion. So the, the plan is to talk a little bit about vectors, um, and we'll talk about true vectors and mechanical vectors and distinguish between them. Talk a bit about them in relation to climate change, since this session is being done in COP26 and is thinking about how these things fit in uh, and how they might change in relation to mitigation of climate change too. We want to highlight the, the importance of interdisciplinary working f between science and policy and the advantages that come from working in collaborative centres um, and for those centres being themselves uh, collaborative with each other in addressing um, policy questions and particularly thinking about peripheral vision and trade-offs between some big ticket policy items. So as I said the, the plan is some examples from animal plant and human health, some discussion we hope with the audience and um, maybe even at the end of the day some recommendations about where we go next. So speaking from my organisation EPIC um, which is, stands for Epidemiology, Population, Medicine and Infectious Disease Control um, and is a centre of expertise in animal disease outbreaks which has been in existence in one form or another since 2006 and is a partnership among these organisations on the right hand side of the slide here and over the years we've been involved in various pieces of work directly looking at vector borne disease and their threat to animal health particularly. And in talking about this, I'm going to start with an example about arthropod-borne viruses and how climate change might affect those. So in this situation, we're talking about viruses that can be carried by a vector, which is an arthropod. In most people's minds, that would be something like a, a, a mosquito vectoring malaria, but it could also be um, images carrying various viruses. And there are lots of other viruses that are, conducted, that are transmitted by an insect vector that takes the infectious agent, in other words, the virus, or in the case of malaria, the plasmodium parasite, from host to host. Um, those diseases have been much focused upon for their relevance to climate change because the range, the, the, the places where those vectors can live are often determined quite by quite narrow margins of temperature and humidity and other climate sensitive conditions. So um, in, in Scotland, one of the remits of EPIC is to think about exotic diseases of animals, which we don't currently have in Scotland, but which might come into the country um, and under changing climate conditions might be able to establish and be transmitted and cause more of a problem than they do currently. So when we think about the, 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 the impact in, in, of climate change on these viruses, then there are two ways in which climate change can affect them. So the, the one I've already talked about and made um, um, reference to is that, of course, about, about the vectors being found in new places because the environmental conditions now are, are, are more favorable for them. And usually what we mean by that is warmer and, and damper. Um, but as we shall see, that is not always the case. And then changes of the ability of the virus to propagate so maybe the vectors feed more frequently because they're able to be more active 
or they become infectious more quickly. And here's an important part of vector-borne disease or, or a number of vector-borne diseases, which is often forgotten by many people, which is that the, um, in many cases, the, the infectious agent needs to go through a period of maturation in the vector before that, vector, that vector is capable of transmitting it to another host. So if you think about um, a midge, feeding on an animal with blue tongue virus, which we'll talk about later, it may acquire, if it feeds an animal that's infected in, and it acquires that virus from the bloodstream, it then flies off and it takes a period of time for that midge to be able to transmit virus to another animal. And that time is called the extrinsic incubation period. And in many cases, that can be sensitive to temperature as well as the survival of the vector itself. So if we look about at blue tongue virus here, this is looking at um, a risk map for Scotland. This is based on work done in EPIC. And it's looking at various parameters of that vector system to transmit blue tongue disease. The black line here shows, oh, sorry, I should say on, on the X axis, we have temperature. On the Y axis, we have one over this extrinsic incubation period. And on this Y axis, we have probability. So, and, and the black line is the overall likelihood of transmission of that infection. So we can see that up until about just below 15 degrees C, there's really no possibility at all, because largely because the virus cannot mature in the, in, in, in the vector. So even if the, if the virus comes in at an animal and a, and a, a midge feeds on it, it isn't able to transmit it to any other animal because the virus doesn't mature. But as temperatures increase, that extrinsic incubation period becomes viable and comes down um, in, a, in a sort of in a relationship with, with, with temperature, increasing temperature. So as the temperature rises, that incubation period gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And the, 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 the midge becomes capable of transmitting. But also, as temperature, right, temperature goes up, the probability of a bite from those, those vectors goes up too. So they're more active at higher temperatures. So they're more likely to bite. However, they are also more likely to die. And the hotter it gets, the less likely the vector is to survive. So the combination of these three inputs into the overall output is what determines how well or not that disease will transmit. And so using those kind of models and using sort of daily, sorry, hourly temperatures, we can look at the risk of transmission in Scotland compared to other parts of Europe and the rest of the UK. And you can see on this, on this map here, we're talking about um, longitude and latitude. And this is a, a sort of heat map of, of how probable, how high, sort of the, the sort of likelihood of transmission. And, and you can see that for much of Scotland, that is reasonably low, it's pretty cold. By, but, but we could be quite different to other parts of England. Sorry. So this is giving you some idea of the kind of work that we do. And that feeding this into government allows them to formulate policy about what we do about incursion of blue tongue in an animal, given how likely it is, if, 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 a, if a, an infected animal is detected, how likely is that infected single animal that's, that comes into the country, perhaps imported, is going to, to transmit that infection and lead to a widespread outbreak with all the impacts on animal pro productivity, food production, uh, uh, and so on. Taking another vector-borne disease, in this case a liver fluke, which is a parasite which infects cattle, sheep, principally in Scotland, um, but is capable of infecting other animals too. It has um, a life cycle that means that it lives part of its life in those animals and part of its life in a snail, and in a snail that likes living in wet places. And again, work we've done has shown uh, that as the climate gets warmer and wetter, so does the likelihood of this disease become more and more important. And this is already well known and well described. And, and the West Coast, again, you know, using a, a sort of red being more risk and blue being low risk, the West Coast is much more likely to be a fluke affected area than the East Coast, though as, t as, the, as the climate changes and the other, other areas have higher rainfall, then it's likely 
that the disease will be more able to transmit and, and, and cause problems in that area. Of interest in this too is on, on, on over here on this, this top part here is that looking at this system and, and modeling it the way we do, we, we show that 55% of the risk is due to on-farm management, so non-climate issues. So, so that's helpful too, because it means that there are things that we can do. We can't, obviously we can't control or change the climate, um, certainly not dramatically, but there's lots of other things that we can do that mitigate the risk. And again, that helps um, make plans and implement them to reduce the impact of this disease. Looking again at similar maps, in this case, in this case looking at um, two diseases, um, Lyme disease and Lauping ill virus, both of which are transmitted by ticks in Scotland. Um, and these are our, our, our own native tick, which has been here certainly a lot longer than I have, um, and is endemic. And both these diseases are in our tick populations. And what we're really showing is this is the, the, the situation in the current climate, and this is what we would predict the situation to be under a 2.5 degree centigrade increase in, in temperature. And again, the, 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 the sort of redder is, uh, or more orange is suggesting higher activity and higher risk, um, whereas the green is the, is the lowest, oh, in fact, the white is, is, is the lowest and then green and so on. So looking at these maps, what you can perhaps see is not a, a, huge, a huge change in distribution, but quite a difference in intensity of risk. Um, and again, part of that is because ticks don't particularly like dry conditions. So a warmer climate doesn't necessarily mean more tick risk, um, particularly if it's accompanied by drying out. So the important point, I think, again, to make is that, that, that for most of these diseases, there is not a simple, straightforward story about how climate will affect these, these things that are capable of transmitting infectious agents among animals, and in, in, in the case of, in case of Lyme disease, between animals and people. Um, and indeed, um, of course, the climate change impacts on the ticks will also have impacts on the populations on which they feed. Uh, and again, those distributions and those impacts are not really included here, and are very difficult to include in the, in, in, in the, the complexity of the system. Finally then, um, I, I, I present a, a sort of summary of some of the work that EPIC has done for Scottish Government, which is to look at how, how livestock disease risk might change with climate. And this is again looking at projections of what the climate might be like in the future. Um, there's a published paper which is referenced there. And this is a, a, a sort of graphic that we use quite a lot with our, our policy teams um, to describe what, where we are in terms of the likely um, impact on the x-axis, uh, excuse me, on the y-axis and the, um, the sort of probability or, the, or the, the chance of introduction. And these diseases are all got little acronyms in here, um, foot and mouth diseases, FMD, ASF, African swine fever and so on. And the different colored dots are different species of animals. And we maintain this based on international surveillance and discuss it with our government colleagues. And what, what it's really showing is that as the climate changes, the risk of these diseases, AHS is African horse sickness, WNV is West Nile virus, LSD is lumpy skin disease, BTV is blue tongue in um, sheep at the top, cattle down there, and ASF is African swine fever. And all of these diseases have a component of their transmission which depends on vectors. And you can see that the predicted climate change impact of each is going in the wrong direction. That's where I'll pause, thank you, and hand over to Ian to talk a bit about the Plant Health Centre. Thank you. thank you. So the Plant Health Centre has been going since 2018. Um, I think it's very important to start off by showing just how different the climate of Scotland is to the rest of the UK. And I think when I do that, you'll see just how many similarities there are with the animal vectors that Dominic was speaking about. So in terms of Scotland, this is a map showing the average temperature, this left-hand side showing the average temperature 
in January of Scotland over 30 years between 1981 and 2010. Red means warmer, blue means colder, and you can really clearly see that in Scotland, particularly in the Highlands, it's much cooler, particularly the, uh, uh, especially compared with the south of uh, Great Britain there. This is really important, especially for vectors and other insects, because they tend to overwinter uh, in, during the winter months. And because Scotland's colder, we get, tend to get much less insect problem going then into spring and summer. So that's one of the main reasons we don't get many insects in Scotland, is because of this overwintering, because it's cool. The second one shows a similar map, this time of soil temperature, which is equally important for vectors in the soil, such as nematodes. And the last one is precipitation over the same period. You can see that we get that along the west coast, but particularly in Scotland. And Dominic's already said how important precipitation is to certain types of vectors. One of the things that we do within the centre is look to develop models, particularly generic models, that allow us to act very quickly when a pest or disease threatens to come into Scotland. So if we've got a model that we can use almost off the shelf, it makes our job much easier. And this is one example of a model. This model's been uh, developed by Professor Adam Klepkowski from the University of Strathclyde. These kind of models do lots of things. They look at the economic impacts, they look at the chance of a pest or disease or vector coming into Scotland and also look how it spreads. But recently we've added a module that looks at climate. And I just want to give you a quick example of how it works. So what you see here on the left hand side is uh, the change in temperature over a year. You can see January to December. The red line is the average temperature over a 30 day period. And you can see how it increases clearly over summer. And what Adam and colleagues have done is actually been able to model that increase with this blue line, which means that we can now use that as part of the model. You'll also see the solid blue line at nine and a half degrees. And although this is an example, this is saying that if we had a vector that was only able to spread at temperatures over nine and a half degrees C, we can see that it would only be active between May and November, and almost certainly more active in the summer months. So we can use that information in the model. We can then look at climate prediction data, and we see in this case that uh, this is the top right, that we have an increased frequency and level of warm weather events over the next two or three decades. And this has direct consequences for the increase in spread of this particular vector. So you can see by putting in different parameters for different vectors, we can very quickly get an understanding of how they're likely to act in Scotland. This is another example, again by Professor Klepkowski and his colleague Vincent Keenan. And in this case, it's looking at the spread of a pest called emerald ash borer. Actually, as far as we know, this is not a vector, but it's a really nasty pest. It's been found to cause huge damage in the US, in Asia, and in Russia. And you can see from the red dots, and I apologize if you're colorblind, you probably can't see, but hopefully you can see the red dots and there where they've been found in Russia and starting to move into Eastern Europe. And what Vincent's been doing is taking all the data, all the climate data of where these pests has been found. And he's extrapolating that onto the rest of Europe and saying, is it likely that this pest is gonna be able to cause disease uh, in uh, the rest of Europe. And what you can see here in green is that the answer is almost certainly yes. And even now, if it was able to get into the rest of Europe, we'd be seeing big problems potentially. You see, however, that where it's quite warm in the south of Europe and particularly in the north of Europe, the, the conditions are not quite conducive to disease. Uh, and of course, that includes Scotland. So at the moment, we don't think, even if the pest was able to get in, it wouldn't cause big problems. However, if we look 30 years hence, again due to 
climate predictions, you see very clearly now that Scotland is in that zone. So it's not just about now, it's about predicting what's going to be in the next 10, 20, 30 years' time. That was an example of something that isn't here yet. I just wanted to give you a, a real life example of something that's happening now in Scotland. And this is about potatoes, aphids or green flies, and a virus called potato virus Y or PVY. This map, you can see the red dots and the blue dots. The red dots are all the ware potatoes grown in Scotland. And just in case you don't know, a ware potato is a potato that's grown that goes straight to a supermarket or for processing that we then eat. The blue ones are the potatoes that are used for seed. And they're grown for five or six years before they're used as seed to grow the ware potatoes. You can see very clearly here that the blue dots are mainly in the north, and there's a very good reason for that. And that is because aphids, although they're spread over the whole of the UK, are much less likely in Scotland, and particularly as you get further north in Scotland than they are in the, in the rest of the UK. So one of the main reasons that we have high-grade seed potatoes grown in Scotland is because we don't get this this uh, pest, this vector. And the reason that this is a problem is because it carries the potato virus Y. So we see very clearly when you get warm weather, you get more aphid and it spreads the virus more. And it's really obvious. And in recent decades, that's becoming more and more obvious. So that's a, a real life issue that's happening now. And then a final example, Xylella fastidiosa. Xylella fastidiosa is a bacteria that causes disease all around the world, not yet in the UK. You might have heard on the news about the damage to olive trees in Italy. It's caused huge problems in Italy. It's caused millions of trees to die. Some of them are two or three thousand years old. And it's causing a huge problem for the olive industry in Italy at the moment. It's spread by a vector called a spittle bug. And we all know spittle bugs. You know, in the garden, when you get, we call it cuckoo spit, when you get the cuckoo spit on the plant in your back garden. Um, it's caused by these. And in Italy, it carries the xylella and is slowly spreading it from the south tip of Italy up further north. And it's really hard to stop because even though you can try and make uh, divisions in the land to, so, where you don't plant olives, it's really hard to stop an insect from flying further north, and that's what's happening at the moment. Spittle bugs are ubiquitous in, in the UK, they're everywhere. So actually, in terms of climate, this is not really a story about the vector and climate change, because it's here anyway. It's much more a story about xylella, because we know there are different temperature variants, and we're, there are two, particularly two different ones, one that works at cooler temperatures. And if this were to get into Scotland, it could start to be a problem. We don't think the climate's quite warm enough now, but in the next 10 or 20 years, it certainly would be. The other thing is that unlike animals, plants are uh, very sensitive to the air temperature around them because they aren't warm blooded, of course. And that means that as for, for plants that are very happy in the current environment, as the climate warms and it becomes drier in summer, they become more stressed, and stressed plants are very much more likely to succumb to disease. You might be asking the question, we don't have olive trees in Scotland, so it isn't a problem. Actually, that's true, but this pathogen causes disease in over 500 different plants. So this is difficult because we actually, it makes it very difficult to know where to look. And even if you find it, we don't know how it's spreading. And so the authorities have been very, very careful in trying to make sure it doesn't come into Scotland in the first place. OK, just a few examples. And I just want to finish by acknowledging uh, uh, the people involved in the work and the links. And in terms of EPIC, we have a number of people there. I won't go into them all. And thanks to uh, Public Health Scotland and then for the Plant Health Centre and actually the people that I've listed, but many more besides. So thank you very much. And I'll pass back to Dominic.
Thank you, Ian. So hopefully that, that's given you a taste of the, the, the bits of work that we've been doing, focusing on aspects of climate change in relation to vectors uh, and vector-borne diseases in plants. So we now want to um, move into a panel discussion. And so we're going to sit at the top here. And Adam, I think you're going to join us. Thank you very much. Um, and if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask those once we're sitting down. Thank you, Lorna. The poor ash tree, surely with ash dieback um, and this oncoming threat potentially to it, Ian, um, is that really the way out for ash in Scotland? Ash is already under a, a lot of pressure at the moment and it's without doubt if this pest came along as well there would be a lot of problems. And actually some of the breeding that's taking place to try and find ash trees that are resistant to ash dieback also have this pest in mind because it's really important that if it does eventually come in, especially if it's going to start causing disease in 10, 20, 30 years time, we have to be prepared for it. And so that's what's happening. And we hope it won't mean the end of ash, but it's certainly under a lot of pressure at the moment, there's no doubt. Is there a lot of diversity in the population of ash? There is, but the diversity gets less as you select for resistant varieties. So it's really important that you consider diversity and you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Because, for example, if you did and you got uh, a very clonal um, ash growing uh, around Scotland and, and it was resistant to, uh, to um, ash dieback, but it wasn't resistant to emerald ash borer, then we'd be in a lot of trouble. Thank you, Ian. If my, can I just add to this? I mean, we, uh, we've actually got a number of projects looking at Ash Dieback uh, at uh, Strathclyde and a few other institutions. And uh, I mean, there's certainly about 90% of ash trees are affected at the moment. Uh, what's going to happen next is really trying to breed out of this and, and trying to raise up the new generation of ash uh, and, and looking, but it's, it's really about uh, what we want our future forests to look like and what is the place of ash, what's the place of other tree species. And it's just trying to think, I mean, the climate change is going to happen uh, to the larger or smaller degree. And it's really how we prepare for that and what we do as a society as we move into this future and, and how to prepare our forests and our trees. I mean, ash is, a, is an urban tree uh, as well as the, the wild tree. So it's how those trees will look like in the future. Thank you. I was going to follow up on that. I, I, I think, um, so tree planting is obviously a very topical sort of thing at the moment in relation to COP26 and, and a lot of commitment about stopping deforestation and redressing that balance and I, I, as, as a, an animal health person I'm with a foot in a, a public health camp so I talked about ticks and Lyme disease which is a human disease it's pretty well demonstrated that ticks much prefer woodland to open moorland habitat so I'm interested in sort of discussing a bit about plans for for tree planting and, and, and you know that's a bit of a headline thing it, so is all tree planting good I mean, so, so if I can start, from my point of view, we have to plant trees. Yeah. It's really important that we plant trees. Uh, the government, of course, is very keen on planting trees. They're also aware that you can't plant any tree at any time in any place. And particularly uh, from my point of view, from a plant health point of view, it's really important that we plant the right kind of tree as the question, Lorna, that you asked about um, the diversity, the heterogeneity within woodlands, it's so important that if you were to go and plant the first tree you came across and you planted thousands and thousands of, of hectares of it, only to realise that, uh, whoops, we've planted ash and, you know, and there's going to be a big problem, or even if it's something different, if it's not um, heterogeneous, then it could be a, a big issue. 
But, but the other thing to consider is the biodiversity that lives on these trees, uh, the corridors between different types of woodland, uh, corridors that allow biodiversity to move around, but also that might allow vectors or other pests to move and survive very easily. So there are many, many factors involved in which is the right tree in the right place at the right time. Sorry, a fo follow up with that, um, with a, also on the right soil. Um, yes, sure. <laughs> but, but can I get the panel's opinion on agroforestry? Because it's important that we add more um, organic matter to the soil and the diversity so we get resilience. So could each of the panel tell us about the place for trees and animals interacting on the farm? Thank you. Do I, first, do yeah. I start again? Yeah. Um, it's really important. I think it's important that we change the way that we've been farming for the last uh, 70 years or more. Um, things like pesticides are really important. Fertilizers are really important for the way that we farm at the moment, but we realize there's a finite limit and we know that at least some of the chemicals that we use are not necessarily good for the environment or even people. Some are okay, but others might not be. And, but it's not sustainable, and therefore we have to find new ways of farming. And I think the idea of not having huge swathes of land just for agriculture, where we can spray whatever we need to help them to grow, we, we can't keep doing that. We have to look at balancing the environment much better and trying to protect the soil rather than just keep adding these chemicals so, and that also means looking at how we can add different crops at different times to try and help the soil as well. So I, I think this area is growing much more quickly uh, than it has in the past and I think it's going to continue there and it's very important. One, one factor that, also coming back to Dominic's point uh, about uh, ticks here, uh, is to look at what really, what's the, what's the social and economic background, do you think? And, and, uh, and is really what people want of the forest. Uh, I mean, do we want a forest that is productive, uh, in a sense that we can uh, harvest it for wood? That's one type of the forest. There are other types of forest where it is more for recreation, for biodiversity. And agroforestry fits into this as a type of a forest. Uh, as a type, as another heterogeneous element of the mosaic of different forests. Uh, and urban trees, we haven't talked about urban trees, but urban trees are very important. Um, uh, this, I've just learned today that uh, we're not allowed to plant trees on George Street and Glasgow for some historic reasons, mm. which is absolutely mad. But um, what I want to make a point here is that, is that it, if we don't have people with us, on those planning agroforestry is farmers and uh, users of the forests, uh, we're going to run into trouble uh, because it, it's what we want to use those trees for. Mm. In the same way as we want to use animals uh, for. Yeah, so I think in answer to your question about agroforestry, Lorna, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, so I, I, you know, I'll put that out there first. Uh, my sense is though, um, there probably isn't one size fits all. Um, uh, so I can see lots of persuasive arguments for it and I see people exemplifying it quite well. I think the point, you know, the word, I mean, it's probably an overused word um, that Ian made in terms of sustainability um, is, is really important. And, and I think I, I'm, I'm quoting now from Kate Rowell who's um, Head of Quality Meat Scotland talking about sustainability as something that is not just an environmental concept but also a personal concept, an economic concept and a social concept. Uh, and so um, I think for people to work and have a livelihood on the land, uh, land needs to yield profit. Um, I think, you know, you can look at some of the farming, the food production systems that we have and say, gosh, they're pretty high yielding, but they're pretty much if they're high yielding, they're likely to be high input. And in my view, probably more vulnerable than we, we probably give them credit for. So, you know, if you, if you get things wrong, there's not an argument for, for, for sort of, for low profitability or low input necessarily, but I think, and, and you know, clearly there is an imperative to 
have productive land that feeds our population. And, and certainly, uh, you know, again, we don't want to get into the issues of, you know, home produced versus imported food and, and you know, and what, what we might bring in with it in terms of, you know, odd little vectors who are hitching a ride. But, but um, you know, g given that we, we, you know, we accept we want to have productive land, um, then I think it's about having an, a, an equation that looks viable, sustainable, uh, and, and offers employment to people too, so that, so that, so that, so that they can invest, if not necessarily, not necessarily their capital, but at least their time in, in making it work. Um, so it's probably, it's, probably, it's probably naive to say some sort of market stability would help, but I mean, inevitably it would, I think. That's probably, it's probably a way of sketching around your question, but I, I think those things are... are, are so I, I, I think, I think the, 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 the idea of a mosaic is, is, is quite good. And, um, I said in the earlier session today, you know, climate change is something that gets reduced to headlines. You know, our, our whole world is reductionist. You know, and I'm an epidemiologist, I use statistics all the time. So reductionism is very pervasive from what we do. But actually, um, the, the bizarre thing about the world at the moment is we're all so time poor that all we've got time for is the, is the headlines and the, and, and the key messages. And yet we're, our, our scientific advances mean that we're able to portray the world in ever greater detail and ever more complexity and appreciate that. But somehow that, that complexity doesn't find its way up to the place where it really needs to be taken into account. And that's probably enough for me at that point. <laughs> I want to add one, just one more thing to this. Uh, it's good to look for different solutions, like agroforestry or others. But, uh, but particularly with trees, uh, the, the, the biggest problem is that we're planting them for long periods of time. I mean, the lifetime of a tree is, uh, is I mean, it depends. I mean, uh, urban trees is probably only 15 years or 10. And that's because we're just very good at killing them. <laughs> uh, but some of the trees uh, that we're planting will be lasting for the next 500 years. Mm. So in a sense, it's the question of how do we plan for such long periods of time. Uh, so there is this danger that we come up with these slogans and easy solutions that are very, uh, very timely, but not necessarily good in a, in a sort of long 200, 500 years. Thank you. I can see um, David. I've got to go to you first. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks very much, uh, Dom. Um, it, from recollection, one of the lessons learned from foot and mouth was the consequences of shutting the countryside. So the, the policy decision um, learned from that uh, from that lesson was learned with ash dieback. So it was more about responsible access to the countryside. Have we or are we learning anything from the policy responses to COVID-19, which will continue to inform us in the next such outbreak, which would relate to animal or, or health, animal or plant health? Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'll go first on that one. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So, so I think yes. I mean, looking at, on a positive view, I mean, I think people are far more aware now of their own agency in disease transmission than perhaps they ever have been. And um, you know, we talk about vectors, and you know, the vectors I was talking about are, are, are sort of true vectors, where we're talking about you know a generation of the pathogen in the vector. But mechanical vectors basically mean anybody picking something up on their shoes and taking it somewhere else, or or, or, or moving plant material from one country to another, which happens to have a few mosquitoes in it or whatever. So, so um, I think human, human agency and, and human movement about the place um, is, is probably never been better recognized as a way of also taking unwanted passengers with us. Um, and I think, um, you know, a, lo a long time think about anecdotes that I've heard from farmers in relation to biosecurity and in relation to just your example about foot and mouth disease where they are restricted on their farms, they have to use boot dips, but if there happens to be a public foot bath across their farm, there's nothing to stop anybody walking across there 
and then to their neighbor, and then further on down the path to someone else. And that, that's something that is, is, is contentious in their minds. And, 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 and so there are lots of examples of that kind of dilemma that happens. Um, I, I think uh, that the sort of idea about disease security is, is, is probably better understood than, bef than ever before. I think it remains to be seen how we capitalize on that and what impact it will have. From my point of view, before 2012, when Ash Dieback was in the news, very few people, except myself and my few friends, used to talk about plant health. And uh, after Ash Dieback, it became, people started to understand a little bit more about it, especially when you see plants starting to die, especially when trees die, because in agriculture, you know, crops have been dying for, for a, a lot longer before. And actually trees were dying, but just not to the same extent. And I think when uh, COVID came along and people start to really appreciate the importance of modeling and how things, how scientists, how important a role of scientists is in understanding the spread through things like modeling, it's, it's not just helped to understand the human side, it's also helped to understand the spread of diseases for animals and plants as well. And it actually, more importantly, I think it shows that we're all under the same umbrella. Whatever the host is, it, it's, all, it's relevant to all of us. And I think that's been a really important thing, mainly because everybody, probably everybody in the world now, knows about the importance of keeping on top of how these things are moving around through modelling. I mean, there is definitely a huge, uh, huge progress in that case, that understanding of the importance. I mean, even the terms, the simple terms, epidemiological terms, uh, like uh, susceptibility and rate of spread, and I mean, we're just, it's just the evening <laughs> tabletop discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, interestingly, coming back to the plan health, uh, I mean, that's, that's, uh, it's clearly different perceptions. So the, the Ash dieback was a, was a big step that let people realize. Even though a few years earlier, we had Phytophthora ramorum, which decimated uh, large trees in the UK. In the UK. So, and it's, it's quite interesting because the perceptions have changed. Yeah, and, definitely. And then hopefully, we're, we're sort of, with COVID, and one of the fortunate outcomes of COVID is that everybody becomes so interested in those. So uh, it's a question of how do we capitalize on that and, and on the engagement of the general population with those concepts, including plant health, including animal health as well. Yeah, maybe just follow up on that. I mean, I think on the, on the question of modeling, I mean, clearly Epic uses models, infectious disease models quite a lot. And, and through COVID, we um, formed a consortium to, to apply some of those animal disease models to COVID transmission among people. And um, again, you know, we have people working in, in BIOS in Scotland who have part of their time doing plant health models and part of their time doing animal health models. So these are transferable concepts uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they, they parameterize infectious organisms, they parameterize hosts, they sometimes parameterize vectors, and they parameterize what happens to the relationship among those agents. Um, those allow you to show what's going to happen, but they also allow you to simulate the impact of, of a mitigation measure. And, and again, that's why they're so useful as a way of, of helping to uh, the policymakers to choose among different options, uh, because you can, you can, you can you can never, 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 never replicate reality, but at least you can, you've got some, you can use a model, you can, you can explore some scenarios about how well or how effective or not they might be. And just to add, Adam's uh, skills are, are important. He's worked on animal um, modeling. He's worked on plant modeling with the Plant Health Center. And he's also recently during COVID written some excellent blogs on um, COVID as well, so which are well worth reading. And I think that just shows how these skills are transferable and how we all really need to uh, bring these skills together, whatever the host might be. And that's something, hopefully, that we're showing that we're doing in this meeting today. I mean, the, the concept of One Health, uh, yeah. which is, uh, which I don't know how much uh, everybody is familiar with, uh, that, been that had been coined well before Ash Dieback and well yeah. before uh, before uh, COVID, but a concept that 
the, the epidemiology, the epi uh, infectious diseases and other diseases as well are in some sense common and need solutions coming mm -hmm. from wider range. And as one health, as just concept bringing in animal health, human health, and uh, environmental health and plant health, and actually without solving those together, we, we, yeah. we, we're, we're not able to solve each individual elements. Uh, again, sort of anecdotally, uh, going back to 1942, um, uh, uh, a quite well-known example of a big outbreak of uh, uh, rice disease in, uh, in India, uh, the Bengali uh, famine, um, caused by environment uh, where the disease spread among the uh, plants and then caused a disease spread among people mm -hmm. because people were malnourished and mm -hmm. that allowed the spread. So it's just showing how those different elements are actually linked together and uh, the challenge is really, and I think we're starting to understand this more and more, uh, particularly with COVID, is to look at those things not in isolation but rather as a, as a whole package. Yeah. And, and this concept of One Health, I, I think we've, we, might not, we might not use it all the time, but I think in Scotland we've been doing it for a long time. And I think particularly in Scotland, the science in Scotland, the scientists in Scotland are particularly good at working together. Uh, we're not a huge country. We've got a lot of uh, very good scientists. and whatever our disciplines we do come together and work well so the centers all the centers are working well together including the ones on climate and water um, of course the safari who are sponsoring this event with the knowledge exchange and all the scientists within the research institutes but also as evidence today the universities within scotland as well so uh, it's really great to be, and I, I sit here as a plant scientist, completely comfortable, surrounded by <laughs> modelers and animal uh, health experts, because that's what we do. And it's a, I think it's a really healthy situation to be in for us all. Charles, you've got... Yeah, I think you've probably answered my question, actually, in, in, in quite a bit of detail, but clearly you're, the modeling from both the animal and the plant health aspect with uh, vector-borne disease shows a huge threat, an, an existing one and then potential new threat rising with, with climate burden. Um, and it's great to hear that there is such a sharing and uh, a body of acceptance, certainly at the research and uh, probably agency levels around the One Health agenda. But in terms of the land users and the, the people who are going to have to adapt and adopt new management practices, new interventions, probably some of, some of which we don't yet have, is there, an, is there the similar appetite to change as rapidly as they might need to and to adopt new technologies, new management practices, new integrated approaches? Are you seeing that keep pace with the, uh, the, 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 the threat that are being revealed by climate? I don't mind. Uh, I, I, well, I'm going to answer it in a slightly controversial way, probably. In the, um, clearly, there's urgency. I mean, and, and the messages that are coming out of the, the COP26 are about urgency. And the, the, the discussion we heard this morning is, you know, how quickly we need to get going. You know, I'm already behind where, where, where we are in terms of targets. Set against that, in, in, in my mind at least, is a, a, a couple of weeks ago I went to a sustainable farming. Uh, event and one of the speakers there was someone who had radically changed how they produced milk um, by lots of different cha management changes on the farm and the commentary from that person was it took us 10 years to learn how to use this to how, to, how to do this new system and there were two or three times in the in the time when we changed when we almost went but we, we, we turned back because the change was quite different. So I think maybe, the, maybe this is a novel thing, maybe it's not a novel thing, but th 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 there's, there's a need, I think, oftentimes things done in haste are not necessarily done right, and then you have to put back, you have to, you have to sort of repair the unintended consequences of the hasty action. So, so 
I think the urgency is really important, but I think it's also important to engage with the stakeholders and find out what's the right pace of change. I mean, again, it's going to be difficult to, 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 to differentiate among sort of dragging feet versus you know, um, appropriate caution, which is you know, if we're going to change um, things quite radically, then we probably have to be realistic over about, first of all, how long it takes to do that, and then secondly, how long it takes to evaluate. Uh, uh, and again, I think some of, the, some of the systems we're talking about working with, you know, lifespans of trees and all that kind of stuff, you can probably wish all you like for those to be super dynamic, but that probably isn't right. <laughs> From my, your question, it was a little bit difficult to understand because of your mask, so I hope I'm answering the right question. But um, I work a lot with uh, industry, the, the arable industry, and I'm always amazed at how clued up they are and willing to try new things when they come along. Um, it, it's really important to say that conventional farming, although Sometimes people might want to knock it and say we need to move away and we need to do other things. And I think ultimately we do need to start to move away, but it has provided food for us for the last many decades and it's, it's provided a lot of food. And it also provides an income for farmers and means that it's economically viable. And sometimes it's only just economically viable. So they're willing to change, but there are two things that you need for change to occur. One is that you need the methods to change too, and I think that's what we're all, we, we have been and we will continue to do is to try and find those, those methods. And secondly, it has to be economically viable for people to move on and do. And, you know, maybe there are examples of where we're starting to do that. For example, biocontrol methods instead of some pesticides, for example. Um, but we have to have the methods first, and then we have to make sure that people can afford to put them into practice second. So it's not a straightforward thing, and I actually don't think that it's people's unwillingness to move. I think it's the, the methods have to be there and have to be economically viable. I agree. I mean, that's, that's, it's embedding, and again, understanding this in a context, uh, that uh, the change is, is only there. That we, we can only move to the new state if, if there is a viable path. Otherwise, things will get back. And I mean, I do, I do observe it. I, I, I live on a farm, and we, we look at other farmers around us and see how much investment it needs to actually change the production. So one of the neighboring farms have just changed to new milk production, as, he, as Dominic just mentioned. And that costed an enormous amount of money. Uh, I mean, it's a fantastic new, uh, new, new place, uh, but there is a lot of cost. And that requires a lot of societal decisions and economic decisions and government mm -hmm. decisions, where we need to think what we want agriculture and forestry and uh, recreational forestry to actually do for us. So those are the questions that the society and politicians need to answer themselves. I mean, we can provide, we're scientists, we can provide tools and we can provide understanding and advice. It's the society that needs to, under, to, to guide where we're going with that. Just, just one nice example of where change is already occurring, and that is the use of herbicides to get rid of weeds in fields. And we, actually the Plant Health Centre is working with companies that are able to develop software through precision agriculture that, uh, where, a tra where you can put a camera on a tractor that goes down a field. It sees that there's a foreign plant in the field and the tractor is able to go and just spray that one plant. So instead of spraying a whole field and doing it 10 times just to make sure things don't grow, you're concentrating just on the plants that are growing. And I mean, that's an incredible saving in herbicides. So ultimately, it benefits the grower. But of course, it's benefiting us all because we're using less herbicides. So things are happening. Things are changing now. And they'll continue to go like that, I think. Thank you. Uh I'm mindful of time, um, so we are on pretty much on time. Um, so 
I think it's time for me to, to draw this to a close. Um, uh, and I hope that you've um, enjoyed our discussion. Uh, I think we've, we've come to a point where we recognize that um, working together uh, uh, and, and each of us stepping away from our comfort zones to do this is, is actually very, very beneficial. So it's quite, I mean, I'm, I'm not at all worried about standing up and saying, I know very little about plant health, but I know people that do, and I know how to find them. And I think that's one of the best things about the Scottish Government resas funded centres of expertise, is that there are collections of interdisciplinary people among a collective of interdisciplinary people. And I think the more that we can do that, the likelier it is that we will come up with solutions that are able to at least meet many of the complex demands that are, that are expected of them. So with that, I, I'd like to thank Adam, uh, Ian, uh, for, their, uh, for joining me on the panel, and for all of you for being in the audience, and thank you very much to Tapestry for filming us. Wish you a safe journey home. Thank you. <laughs>